know, as even if this is your first time here, you hear people cheering, and, and that shouldn't be strange to you because you cheer at baseball games, football games, at concerts, and there's nothing wrong with that. Have a good time. But to, we're cheering, if this is true, that he's the savior of the world, the source of eternal life, the one that could set you free and restore your broken life. He deserves a cheer greater than we've given anybody else. And isn't that right? It's real. It's real. And understand, this is, this is not hype. You know what it's called? Gratitude. Lives have really been transformed. If you could just hear the stories that came, of people that came into this place suicidal, broken, hopeless, depressed, and empty. And one encounter with the truth, not with religion, but with the Savior, the creator of the universe, with Jesus Christ, it's transformed their lives forever. It's real, right? All we're doing tonight is putting everything back in perspective. The, the, the scripture says that God has planted eternity in our heart. That means that we really do believe this, that there's life after death. And the reason I know we believe this, you might live like there's not, and you might convince yourself that there's not because you just want to have a good time partying or do whatever you want to do. But when you're at the point of your last breath, you're going to be scared because you're entering into the unknown. And, but the funerals that I do never, and I've been doing funerals for, you know, 30 years, I, I've never seen anybody say they're just the gone. We always say they're in a better place because something within us know that there's something beyond this life. And there's a scripture that says, be careful that you gain the whole world just to get so caught up in this world. And at the end, you lose your soul. That'd be the biggest mistake. And there's another scripture that says, what can a man or a woman give in exchange for the soul, for eternal life? Understand, enjoy life as it is today. And it comes with battles and difficulties and trials and a lot of pain and suffering with it. But understand, this is not it. This is a very short period of time. Then we're going into eternity. But there's something that's ready to happen really soon. Jesus came once, but he's coming back again. He's coming back a second time. And there's perf the, the Bible is not just a history book. It's called a prophetic book. That means it it's also describes events that haven't happened yet. But it also describes today. The Bible's relevant today. So everything that you're seeing today was already written in the Bible. So the Bible continues proving itself over and over. If the, if the, if the Bible said that this is going to happen, it doesn't happen, then throw out the whole book. But everything it says is going to happen is happening and it's going to happen. And, and what we're going to do is start this series tonight. And Jonathan Kahn, that God has given him supernatural divine insight for these last days to interpret like what's happening what's happening and in scripture it talked about what's happened then is happening now we've seen things happen before and history is repeating itself but also are we in the last days or the end times or the end of the ages are we right there at the brink of Jesus Christ coming back there needs to be an awareness of that because if you just live it for a moment you can miss it all and we're just going to reboot and just remember there's more to this life than life here. There's eternal life. And let's look forward to that as well. So get ready for that. So we're going to start tonight, Sunday morning. I'm going to be, I'm going to be speaking and we're going to be talking about the rapture, about Jesus coming back, what the Bible says, what's going to happen. It's going to be a little scary, but we're going to make sure we're ready. But I want you to give Jonathan Kahn. We're so grateful that he's here all the way from back east. He's come up flying all the way here to give us a word from God. Are you guys ready to receive from God? Let's give Jonathan Khan a Wayward Outreach welcome. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, let me greet you. Shalom in the language of Messiah. It is uh, an honor for me to be here. This is alive. You guys are alive in the spirit. 
I heard there were lines outside. You are, you are passionate, and, that, and be, you have tremendous leaders. I was here once before, and I knew it was a special place. Um, and Pastor Marco and Pastor um, Armando and Christian and all the rest are people who love God with all their heart, and they're doing this for you in a blessing. I am just so blessed, because not every church is like that. <laughs> so it is a blessing. Well, let me just, I have a lot to share with you tonight. No matter how much I share, I can only give you a taste. There's so much more. For that reason, my job is to get the word out. Um, and so what they will do, I don't know where I will be and where you will be, um, but they will have a number of my books. Since I was here last time, I've written at least four other books. So I've been busy since I was here last. Um, so, uh, so number one, they'll put it up there. This is what they'll have for you afterwards. Number one is the Book of Mysteries. And that has mind-blowing mysteries of God, and it's uh, not only to get blown away, but give to people in your life who don't know the Lord, because everyone is receiving them and this, these, as gifts, and they are getting saved. That's the book of mysteries. The second is the oracle. The only book that I've ever written is specifically about end-time prophecy, the mystery of the age, the time we have, the countdown we have, Jerusalem, Israel. That's the oracle. Third is the book that just came out. It's the newest book I did, which is called the Josiah Manifesto. That's the ancient mystery and guide for the end times. Um, it actually is, has in there what is yet to come, and it could actually change your life. It's the guide that God, what if God was giving us the, the key for such a time as this? And the last one, which I'm going to give you a little taste of tonight, I was led to share this tonight, is the return of the gods. And that is explosive. Uh, well, you'll hear a little bit of it tonight, but no matter how much I can do, I can just give you a taste, but you'll get a taste. But that is the return of the gods. Now, my calling is to get the word out, to encourage you to do it, not just for yourself. I know this is a real evangelical ministry here, but to give it to people in your life. What they're going to do is this. Most of these are all hard covers. The latest one lists for like around $30 now. It's, but I only do this where I speak. It's going to be, every book will be $15. If you get two, it's going to go down and down and down. If you get a number of them, it's going to be $10 less than a Big Mac meal at McDonald's. But you cannot save anybody with a Big Mac. My, so, you know, that, you know, God says thou shall not steal, but this is a steal he wants you to do. Get it for yourself, get it for others in your life. The last resource, then we're going to get going, is something I only make available where I speak. I often take it on the plane. And this is not available anywhere, pretty much. It's the Josiah Manifesto Uncensored. This is eight one-hour DVDs, and that is, you're actually going to hear, you're not just going to read the mystery, you're going to see these prophetic things unfold. And one of the mysteries in the book actually started coming true right after the book came out. It foretold what would happen in Israel this October, that there would be an attack, it would happen on a Saturday, the first Saturday of October. It is a mystery from God. So what I did is, in this I put an extra, there's a ninth video in there, which has this mystery which may even enable you to know exact events yet to happen. So that'll be there too. It's gigantically reduced and uh, comes out to like something like $4 a, a DVD, okay? And also if you want prophetic updates uh, and free gifts from the Ministry of Hope of the World, just put your contacts and they'll get it for you. And that is it. Are we ready? Father, we praise you tonight and we thank you, Father. I thank you for this precious ministry, Lord. I thank you, Father, that you are here. And I ask, Father, for your anointing. In my weakness, be strong in your power and touch your people. In the name above every name, the name of Yeshua, Jesus, our King. Amen. And at the end, they asked me if I could give you the ironic blessing, the blessing of God, which I will do at the end. What I'm going to open up tonight is the mystery behind everything that is taking place around you. You're all dealing with it. It's one of the most important things I could ever share with you. In many ways, it's going to open up and explain what is happening in a whole new light. And once you see it, you cannot unsee it. I'm going to tell you, this is what I was led to right in the return of the gods. And it's critical because you're in a fight. You all, you have the people up here who are holy warriors. I believe God wants all of you to be holy warriors. If you're in a fight and you don't know it, you're not going to win. We are in a fight. What are the gods? In the ancient times, the world was filled with gods. Every nation, every culture worshipped the gods. The Bible gives a clue to the mystery. In the book of Deuteronomy, it says that those who worship these gods are actually worshipping something in Hebrew called the Shedim. The Shedim is the Hebrew word not for mythology. It's the word for spirits. 
So what it's saying is when they, when they worship these gods, they're actually worshiping spirits behind them. When the ancient Hebrew writers translated the Hebrew Bible into Greek, led to the New Testament later on, they translated the word shedim into daimonia, we get the word demon from it. They were worshiping demons. Paul said when the, the pagan world was worshiping these gods, it's actually worshiping demonic spirits behind the gods. So behind the gods are these entities that the enemy uses. And all the world was worshiping them in one form or another. Next piece of this mystery. Pagan culture was filled with a god, so it was filled with spirits. It was a possessed culture. The closer you got to the gods, the more you acted like someone who is possessed. That's what the pagan world is like. But what happened to all those gods? What happened is Jesus happened. The Lord happened, Messiah happened. God came into the world. He sent his word, his gospel into the nations, into the lands of the gods. The power of God drove them out. It was the gospel that drove them out. And that's why the Christians were persecuted. That's why they were sent to the lions, because it was a war, it was a spiritual war. But in the end, the power of God, the name of Jesus prevailed. The temples of Zeus became empty. The shrines of Dionysus were abandoned. The gods were gone, but it wasn't just the gods, because behind the gods are spirits. So it was the greatest mass exorcism in human history. But spirits don't die. So now comes the next key, comes from the Lord himself. He gave a parable. He said, if a spirit comes out of a man, it goes wandering to dry places, it, look, it looks for a place to dwell, doesn't find there. He says, I'm going to go back to the man that I was driven out of. He calls it his house. I'm going to go back to my house. Goes back to the man, finds him empty. So he says he goes back and gets seven other spirits, and they come back and they repossess the man. And the Lord says, the latter state is worse than the beginning. Now the guy is totally possessed. Now people think, okay, that's about a person. Well, it is, but it's more than that. Yes, if you know the Lord, never turn away from the Lord. But he's speaking more because he says at the end, so it shall be with this generation. He's not just talking about a guy. Here is the warning. Any culture, any nation, any civilization that has been cleansed, delivered by God, has had the gospel come into it, the word of God come into it. If it should ever turn away from God, the house will not stay empty, but the spirits that were cast out of it will come back into it. That is a warning for America. The same thing, those are ancient spirits, they will come back and when they come back, they will come back to repossess the house. In other words, you will have pagan spirits seeking to take a Judeo-Christian nation as America was and will seek to paganize it. If you want to understand what's happening in our culture, the craziness that's happening, we are watching a repossession. Remember that he said the last state will be worse than the first state. You see, a pagan culture will produce a Nero, but a post-Christian culture will produce a Hitler or an Antichrist. And so which ones are, which gods can we actually identify them? In the book I speak of the dark trinity. You see, when Israel turned away from God, there were particularly three gods that became dominant in the culture. The first is called the possessor. Also his name in Hebrew means the master, lord, owner. In Hebrew he was called Baal, you've heard of him, because we call him Baal. Well, what would happen if America started emptying itself of God? The house will not stay empty. In the early 60s, we say we began emptying God out of the culture. We said, we'll take him out of the school. We'll take him from the children. Not a big deal. It's a real big deal. Because if you take God from the children, you're taking God from the future. And everything that's happening now began then. We opened the door, Messiah. The Lord said, don't ever do that. So if you take God out of the schools and out of the children, something else is going to come into the schools. And something else is going to come into the children. So, so now Baal, the possessor, comes to America. And he does what he did in Israel. He, started dry, he starts driving God out of everything, out of the government, out of the culture. In ancient times, Baal caused Israel to turn away from the commandments of God. 
So now this spirit in America has been causing America to turn away from the commandments of God. One after the other. We've actually struck down the Ten Commandments. Not only that, the Bible says that Baal caused Israel to forget God. Well, we have in America, there's an amnesia. Where America, the mainstream culture, doesn't, even, doesn't remember God and doesn't remember that it ever knew God. A little while back, the biggest movies in America had names like The Ten Commandments, King of Kings. We can be, you know, in a little while back, the teachers of America were leading all the children in the public school in the Lord's Prayer. But this has been driven out. It's even behind things we may not even realize. I could just give you a taste. For instance, wokeism. When there's one God, there's one truth. But in paganism, you got many gods, so you have many truths. So everybody has their own authentic truth, which is no truth. If a man says he's a cat, then he's got to be called a cat. If a woman says she's a they, she's a they. There was one sign of Baal among, above all others, and you know what the sign was? It was a sign of a molten bronze bull. Well, could that happen? If you go to New York City, around where I am, go to New York City, you will see a molten bronze bull, a sign in the Bible of a nation that is turning away from God and to the possessor. Now, there's so much more, but that was only the first one. And that is here, when you look at the Bible, Baal comes first, but then comes a goddess, a she. See, Baal opens the door, but the next one is called the Enchantress. In the Bible, she is called Ashtoreth. In Canaanite mythology, she was, she was the wife of Baal. She appears all over. She's called, in Babylon, she was called Ishtar. In Sumer, Inanna. In Greece, she was called Aphrodite. She's the goddess of unbridled sexual immorality, lust. She was a prostitute. In ancient times, she sexualized the culture. See, a prostitute, what does a prostitute do? Takes, takes sex out of marriage and puts it into the culture. Well, we have been watching the sexualization of our culture. And so first you have the turning away, Baal, early 60s. Then it is followed, no accident, by a sexual revolution because that's exactly what we would expect. And what this principality does is seeks to paganize a nation or culture through the realm of sexuality. And so notice what happened. Not only did she sexualize the culture, but also marriage gets weakened when, when, when this is taken out. So we see, the, we see marriage broken. We see families broken. It's all part of the same thing. You know, the ancient Greeks called her the sacred prostitute. They did it in Greek. In Greek, to call her that, her name was in Greek, porne, from which we get pornography. Porn. She is the inventor of the first pornography on planet Earth who had to do with this goddess. She casts a spell. There's so much more we can't get into, but it's no accident. At the same time, in the 60s to now, there came a revival of witchcraft, the occult, tarot cards, psychic hotlines, new age, all that. Well, she was the goddess of casting spells. Now, today in America, there are more witches than there are Presbyterians. And now we have to move on. And she was actually the goddess of drugs as well. The third of the dark trinity, in the book I called it, and she was called the destroyer. This is the principality that caused parents to offer up their children as sacrifices. When Israel turned away from God, they started offering up their children. You know what? That was all throughout the pagan world, you know, because the enemy wants us to destroy ourselves. And you know, so that was all over. You know, the only thing that ended it was the name of Jesus across the world. That was the only, that tells you how right Jesus is. That tells you how right. But the ancient warning is if we turn away from God, this one, the destroyer of Moloch, is coming to America. And so it's like clockwork. First comes the turning from God, Baal. Then comes the sexual revolution, Ashtora, Ishtar. And then after that, America begins offering up its own children. Israel offered up thousands of children. We have offered up millions of children in abortion. We can't go into it, but it, I, I opened this up, and that is when I looked at the pagan sacrifices, and when you look at abortion, they follow, it follows the same pattern. Do you know, I'll say, just say one thing here, do you know which children were offered up to the God more than any other? The children of the poor. 
Which children are offered up in abortion more than any other? The children of the poor. And this sin brought judgment to Israel. What will it bring to America? Now it goes deeper. I looked at the ancient Mesopotamian inscriptions concerning that goddess, that, that an enchantress. And she's something strange. She says in her inscriptions, I am a woman, I am a man. One of her hymns says, you are the one who turns a man into a woman and a woman into a man. You want to understand what's happening in her culture? It all goes back to this. This is her deeper work. It doesn't begin, the beginning would be too shocking, but as she gets entrenched, this is what's happening now. As she takes possession, a spirit at work that blurs the lines of man and woman, male and female, boy and girl. Well, you are all dealing with it. One of the ancient inscriptions says she grinds away the masculinity of men. It's a spirit that enters the culture and takes men away from manhood, away from fatherhood, away from women, away from family. It seeks to emasculate them and it seeks to feminize them from the culture. And what does she do to women? She seeks to take women away from womanhood, away from motherhood, away from marriage, away from men. The goddess does this. And you know, the goddess, she was a, a female, but she had male characteristics, so she's trying to make women into her image. Separate man from woman and woman from man. But it goes even deeper. You see, the goddess had a mysterious priesthood. They were men who filled her temples, and they walked around, the men walked around dressed as women. And they danced as women and performed, and people would bring their children to see the men in drag. If you see this returning to the culture, you know the times you're in. But remember, Messiah said when they come back, it comes, it's worse. In ancient times, she tried to, she possessed her priesthood. But now she is seeking to possess an entire generation of your children. The gods are always after the children. Because if you get the children, you got the nation. If you get the children, you have the future. Began by taking prayer from the children, God from the children. Look what has happened. But it goes even further. The goddess seeks to turn a man into a woman. And, in, in, and actually one of the things that happened among her priesthood is she actually had them, this spirit actually had the men surgically transition to appear as women. I even found an inscription where the, it says the transition men dance before the goddess with scalpels as if to celebrate their transitioning. And now adults are doing this to children. What on earth could possess an adult to do this? This could possess them. And this has been touching our entire culture. Let me show you some of the mysteries behind it. The ancient inscriptions say, reveal that the goddess was the goddess who, of parades, parades. She had, she caused men to parade through the city dressed as women, women parade as dressed as men, with colors and sexual licentiousness and gender bending. Does that sound familiar? You know, that there was not only that, but there was one month in the year that she especially claimed to possess the culture. And I looked in the writings of St. Jerome because he identifies because it was still happening at the beginning. What month was it? It was the month of June. June became, was the month of the goddess of changing gender. And the goddess of the goddess called the goddess of pride. So it is become again pride month. She was a sign associated with the goddess. You know what it was? It was the sign of the rainbow. That's the mystery. That's why the rainbow's taking over. That's why the rainbow is even replacing the cross in our culture. And that's why, you know, I actually, there's a dark mystery. We can't get into it to the rainbow. Every color represents something. And if anybody knew that, they would never lift that thing up. But you know what? The rainbow does not belong to the goddess or to a movement. The rainbow belongs to our God. It is a holy thing. Even the Supreme Court has been influenced. It, it, the Supreme Court handed down several rulings that have affected gender and marriage. We all remember when marriage was struck down. But you know, every single ruling happened in the month of the goddess. and happened actually on the same exact day. 
Even though many years apart, same exact day that's linked to the goddess. And the night, if you remember, when, that, when marriage was struck down so a man could marry a man, do you remember what happened? They, they lit up the White House in the colors of the rainbow. That was the 10th, the day was the 10th day of Tammuz in the Bible, also on the Babylon calendar, 10th day of Tammuz. I looked up that day. It turns out in Babylon they said the 10th day of Tammuz, when the Supreme Court struck down marriage, is appointed to cast a spell over the land to cause a man to love a man. What is the agenda of the God? What is the end game? When the gods, when the spirits first come into a culture, they come in step by step. They come in in the name of tolerance. Anything goes. Do your own thing. That's only to get in the door of a Christian culture. But once they get in, once they get established, everything changes. Then it's every knee shall bow. Every one, every tongue will confess. And anyone who doesn't go along with it, we will cancel them. That's why there's a spirit in our culture to cast out the name of Jesus. Why? Because it was the name of Jesus that cast these spirits out. And you know, it was believers who cast them out. That's why there's a spirit that targets you as a believer. You know, the age began with a war of the gods when the first Christians stood against the gods of the Roman Empire. Well, that war is back because these spirits, it's now round two. And this goes right into end time prophecy. What does it say of the end? It'll be a time of deceiving spirits. Men will become lovers of self. Immorality will increase. People will be without natural affection, and they will persecute the people of God. This is the mystery behind what we are all dealing with. I I'm just can only give you a taste tonight, but I want to get into, I want to bring it home with how it affects you. What do you do? First, it has everything to do with you. Because no matter who you are, you're dealing with it. Somebody in your life is dealing with it in every way. What do you do? Remember Gideon. Gideon had a stand against the gods of the Midianites. In order to do great and mighty things, God said, okay, Gideon, I'm going to use you, but you've got an issue in your backyard. There's an altar to Baal. Break that altar. And so when Gideon broke that altar, he was used to bring salvation to his people. So for you. God has great and mighty things for each of you. There is no calling that is less than another. So the thing is this, if there's anything in your life, any stronghold, any habit, any sin, any idol, anything that's not God, it's an altar, break it. Get it out of your life. Take action tonight. Do what you have to do. And God will use you mightily. You see, you know, listen, what we're dealing with, the people in the Bible dealt with it. Moses stood against the gods of Egypt. Elijah stood against Baal. Daniel stood against the gods of Babylon. Jeremiah stood against Molech. Paul and the first believers stood against the gods of Rome. Now it's our turn. Now it's your turn. If you're born again, you need to stand. And you need to stand strong. And if the dark is getting darker, it's time for the lights of God to get even brighter. Because when, when evil goes from bad to worse, it's time for the good, you, to go from good to great. These are the days that produce greatness. Do not fear the end times. God called you. If God didn't want you here, he would have put you in the Middle Ages. God chose you. He, uh, if he did, he appointed you for this hour. If he appointed you, he's gonna, he will anoint you. If he anoints you, he will empower you. If he empowers you, you will have the victory. Some of you have prayed, Lord, I wish I could live in Bible times. Congratulations, you're here. Welcome to the end times. The darkness is going to bring out the light. It's going to bring out the greatness. The world may have many gods, you know, many gods, but we have the one true living God. There is no God like our God. There is no king like our king. There's no savior like our savior because our God is God. You have the name of Jesus, Yeshua. And by that name, the gods of the world were vanquished. Every power of darkness. The spirits had to flee at the name of Jesus. Yeshua, Jesus of Nazareth. It was the power of that name that drove them out. And that name is just as powerful now as it has ever been. And you need it. The world needs it. By that name, the demons tremble. 
By that name, the darkness flees. By that name, every chain is broken. By that name, every curse is shattered. By that name, every slave is set free. By that name, the sickness is gone and the past is faded away. By that name, you will rise. By that name, you will overcome. By that name, you will be free. By that name, you will be victorious. Use that name. And if these are the days of Baal and Ishtar and Moloch, then these must surely be the days of Elijah. And if the gods have returned, it's time for the Elijahs of God to return. It's time for you to be his Elijah. It's time not to fear, not to compromise. It's time to take your stand in boldness and courage and confidence and power. Take your stand against the gods. And it's time also to take your stand against that thing, that darkness, that sin, that spirit, that habit, that fear, that gloom, that shame, that regret, that wound, that scar that bondage that's been trying to hinder you, defile you, degrade you, bind you, enslave you, depress you, discourage you, shame you, and paralyze you, and say, no, no, no more. I will not bow down my knee to you again. I will not bow down to your bondage. I will not bow down to your fear. I will not bow down to that sin. No, no, no. I will only bow down my knee to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Almighty, Jesus, my Savior, my rock, and my Redeemer. And as for you, you have no authority anymore in my life. For the name of Jesus, the name of Messiah, the name of my God, I say, get out of my land, get out of my nation, get out of my house, get out of my circumstance, get out of my family, get out of my world, get out of my life, get your hell out of my life, for greater is he in me than you who are in the world, the God of my salvation, the eternal, I will prevail, for the Lord says, arise, man of God, arise, woman of God, arise and shine, for your light is come, and the glory of the Lord has risen on you in the name above all names, the name of Yeshua, Jesus the Messiah, the Lord of all, the King of all kings, the Lord of all lords, and the God above all gods. Amen. Come on, let's give Jesus some praise in his place tonight. Come on, it's okay. We're lifting up the name of Jesus, the name above every name. Come on, how many know that God is here in this place tonight? He's here in this room. You know, it's just, can we give Jonathan Khan a round of applause? He's just what we received tonight. In just a moment, he's going to say a prayer of blessing over us. But before we do that, all of this could seem very foreign. All this can seem very... Uh, uh, just something that I, I don't understand, but one thing we need to understand in this moment right now, more than anything at all, is that Jesus died on a cross. He died on this cross. Why did he do that? The Bible talks about it. There's historical records. There's no moment in history that's more proven, that has more evidence for than the moment that Jesus came, lived, died on the cross, and resurrected. It happened. Why did Jesus do this? Why did Jesus die for us? Simple, number one, because we sinned. We've all fallen short. How many know that this is true? We've all sinned, we've all made mistakes. Look at all the hands that went up. I know that I've sinned. What is a sin? Sin could be anything that that misses the mark. Maybe we've cheated, maybe we've lied. Maybe we have hate in our heart for somebody. Maybe there's something that, you, that, you're, that you're hiding right now, a relationship on the side. There's sin that we've all committed. It's true. The Bible also says that the wages, or in other words, the price for sin is death. That means that when I willingly sin, then I willingly take on the price for that sin. There is no sin that's free. There's no sin that we can just get away with and wash our hands and be done with. You know that there's also no sin that we could do good to make up for it. 
I lied. So maybe I'll tell the truth 10 times to make up for it. No amount of telling the truth can make up for it. We paid the, we, we made the decision to sin. Now we owe the price. So the Bible says there's a wage for sin. But if the wage for sin is, the Bible says the wage for sin is death, which is separation from God, which is destruction in our lives now. We begin to experience death now. Not only now, but we experience death after we pass away from this world. And that death happens eternally in a place called hell. In other words, the Bible is saying because of our own decision to, to engage in sin, I owe the price of death for eternity. Where is the hope? If I can't make up for my sin by doing good, if I can't be a good enough person to earn God's love, what then can I do? Because am I doomed? That's why Jesus came, lived, and died on the cross. Why did Jesus die on the cross? Because Jesus loves you so much that he was willing to give his life and replace it in the, in the judgment that you should have paid on the cross that you and I should have done. We should have paid that price. We owe the debt, but Jesus said, let me step into your position as the sinner and pay for it on your behalf. This is, what Je this is why Jesus went to the cross. Jesus was not a criminal. Jesus was not a sinner. Jesus engaged in no wrongdoing. Jesus willingly put himself on the cross because he loves you that much. The love of God motivated Jesus to go to the cross on your behalf. Jesus became your sin. He became the liar for you. He became the murderer on your behalf. He became the cheater on your behalf. He, he became the hateful person inside on your behalf. When he was on the cross, he took upon himself all of your sin, all of my sin, all in one moment. And all in one moment and in one time, Jesus paid for the sin of all humanity. That's how much he loves us. Now what do I do? If Jesus paid for my sin, how do I respond? Now we no longer have to try and work to achieve God's love or perform or try and be better. Or it's, it's almost like if a doctor told you, before you come and see me as a doctor, I want you to cure your own disease, then come see me. We don't have to do that. But you can now come to the feet of Jesus with your sin, with your sickness, with your broken heart, with your depression, with your pain, with your anxiety. And now you can freely give it all to Jesus because Jesus said, I paid for it all. I paid to cover your sin. I paid to forgive you. I paid to give you a new heart. I paid to give you a new life. Jesus purchase your freedom he gave up his righteousness to give it to you he gave up his perfection so he can give you perfection he gave it all so that you can have eternal life so if in this room if you've ever sinned just everybody then you need Jesus if you've ever fallen short of perfection you need a savior because without a savior you're doomed we need Jesus Jesus loves you so much, he's not asking you to go leave and clean up your life. He's saying, come to me right now in the condition you're in. Repent, what does repent mean? He's saying, turn away from your lifestyle. Turn from the way you've been living. Turn from how you've been acting or turn from those things. Don't try to clean up your life, bring it all to me. Bring the dirt, bring the mess, bring the pain to me. Let me change your heart because that's what I do. Jesus is saying, turn from your ways and turn to me and he can give you a brand new beginning tonight. I'm gonna to count to three. If you're in this room tonight, you're saying, I've sinned. I don't know, if I were to die today, I do not know if I'd be eternally separated from God. I don't know if I'd go to heaven or hell, I do not know. But I wanna be certain, and I wanna be sure that my life is in the hands of Jesus tonight. And I'm making a decision right now to turn away from my sinful lifestyle and to give my life to Jesus, the one who purchased my freedom with his own blood. He bought it for me and I'm ready to surrender my life to him. Remember, you don't have to try and go clean up the, all these doubts that say, you have to clean up first to come to God. It's not true. 
You have, to, you have to act a little better before you come to Jesus. No, you can give him your life and your heart in the condition it's in right now and watch what he'll do with your heart. Watch what he'll do with your life. He'll give you, he'll take the old things and they'll pass away and he'll give you a brand new life. So at the count of three, if you're in this room tonight and you're saying, I'm ready to repent, I'm ready to put my faith in Jesus Christ as my savior, as my Lord for my salvation. I can no longer put my faith in my own works, but I wanna put my faith in Jesus. I'm ready to turn from my old lifestyle and I wanna be forgiven of my sin. I wanna be saved and I wanna be set free. That when I count to three, I want you to raise your hand if you're saying, that is me. One, two, three. Raise your hands all over this room. I see all those hands. I see all those hands. I see all of these hands to my left. I see all those hands in the back. I see the hands in the middle. I see all those hands in the back there to my right. I see you guys. I see you. And the Lord sees you right now. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to ask those that raise your hand, I'm going to ask you to do one more thing for me. Can you do this? Can you make your way out of your seat and just come up through the aisle, come up to the front, and we want to congratulate you and pray for you and connect you and help you to grow. We're not going to let you do this on your own. We're going to be right there with you. Church, can we clap for all of those that have made the decision in the back row? Come on up. If you raise your hand here in the middle, just make your way out to the aisle. Come forward to the front. We're going to pray right now in this moment, and this is a celebratory moment. Come on, church. There's still coming. They're still coming. They're still coming up. Come on. They're making a decision today to give their life to Jesus. They're making a decision today. This is a new beginning. This is a new start. Everybody that's up here, your life will never be the same again. Come forward. There's room up here. Find somebody. Find a prayer partner. We're going to pray with you right now. This is awesome. Come forward. They're still coming. Come on up. We're going to need some more altar workers up here, please. DG leaders, we need your help. Praise the Lord. If you're a DG leader, just find somebody that's up here at the altar. Let's connect with them. Let's pray. Everybody that's up here, look at me really quick. Everyone's up here, look at me. Look at me real quick. If you came up here, I can see you guys on the side. I just want to say one thing. The decision you're making right now is the greatest decision you'll ever make. The decision to follow and give your life to Jesus. There's no greater decision. But what we're going to do, what we're committing to doing for you, is we're going to help you in this walk. We're going to disciple you. What does that mean? It means we're going to mentor you. We're going to train you. We're going we're to equip you with the tools you need to grow in your walk with God. And you'll never be the same. There's a class called Holy Warriors. Let's say, let's say Holy Warriors together. Say Holy Warriors. That class is going to train, equip you to follow God, to learn how to walk, learn how to run, learn how to fight, learn how to live for God, learn how to walk in His promises. Your life will never be the same. The person in front of you, they're going to open the church app. They're going to get you signed up. All, they can also scan this code. We're going to sign you up. We're going to pray right now. Once we pray corporately, I want you to stay here because uh, uh, Jonathan Khan, he's going to pray a blessing over us. But let's repeat this together. Every head bowed, every eyes closed. Say this with me. Say, Lord Jesus, thank you that you went to the cross on my behalf. You didn't deserve it, but I did. I confess that I've sinned against you. But right now, I repent from my old way and from all my sin. I put my faith in you, Jesus, as my Lord and Savior. Fill me with your spirit. Lead me and guide me every day of my life. From this moment forward, I'll never be the same. My old has passed away and the new thing is becoming. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me and setting me free. In Jesus' name, amen. God is good. Here's what we're going to do. Altar workers, we're going to stay with them, but we're going to say a prayer of blessing right now. And I want to invite Jonathan Khan up. And he's going, to say a he's going to say a blessing over us. Before he says that prayer, I just want to make sure the information and all the research that he's done is in those books out there. We need to study the end times. Whatever books out there, we want to make sure he's not taking them back to New York. 
Let's make sure we, we sell out, we support, let's get informed, let's get our mind transformed so that we're ready to help people know about what's happening right now. How many know we need to get informed to help people? And the more informed, the more confident you're going to be. He's done all the research, so let's make sure we're getting all that work and studying it and learning it. He's going to come right now and say a, a, a blessing over us. Get ready to receive it. Receive a blessing of the Lord upon your life right now. This blessing is going to speak over your life, will change your life. You're going to see it from tonight forward. How many believe that's going to happen? Jonathan, come, please. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. <clears throat> this is wonderful. Look at this salvation. This is awesome. We should, let's praise God for that. Wonderful. And I'll, as soon as I do this, I'll go wherever they are. I'll meet you. I'll sign as many as I can. Take advantage of it while, while they're here. And I will do that now. This is the blessing that God himself gave. This is not from man. He actually gave the blessing, gave the words. They're in number six. And he said, so you shall bless my people with this blessing. And when you bless them, you will put my name upon their life. And that's the blessing I'm going to give you in the language of Jesus, then in English. And there's something about it. He said, to, he said, the sons of Aaron should give this to the people of Israel. I'm descended from Aaron, so it's a blessing for me to do it. You are born again. You are a citizen of Israel. And so this is for you. So I'm going to ask you to lift up your hands to the Lord as receiving this blessing, not from me, but from the Lord. This is his own blessing. Whatever you need in your life, lift it up to him and, this, and receive this as from your God. of his will. The Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob cause his face to shine upon you, upon your life, upon your home, upon the works of your hands, upon your coming and going. The Lord God of heaven and earth, the eternal great I am, Lift up the glory of his countenance upon you, his servant, upon all your days, upon all your moments, upon all your times, and the Lord give to you his beloved shalom, life, fullness, power, breakthrough, blessings, victory, all the blessings of his love. B'Shem Yeshua HaMashiach in the name that is above all names that are named the name of Jesus or HaOlam the light of the world Uchvod Yisrael the glory of Israel Ba'ari Yehuda and the lion of the tribe of Judah Amen and Amen God bless you God amen. bless you I'll see you wherever they live Thank you can we give Jonathan Conn a round of applause? Thank you.